Welcome back. Nice to see you guys. Um, today I thought to start with an experiment so we can take a look at how your brain works today. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put up some images on the screen and I want you to pay attention to the first place your eyes move to. Okay? So for now, just let's look at the center of the screen. What did you look at first? Did anybody look at this first? So let's go through what happened in your brain when I presented that image on the screen and your brain made a decision to move your eye over to the left, maybe look at the face, maybe some of you guys looked at this one. I don't know if anybody looked at the chair. Anybody? Okay, so let's see what happened when we did this experiment. What happened so that your brain made a decision to look where it did look? All right. What we're going to talk about is this idea that your brain assigns value to stimuli that you sense and you tend to move toward the most valuable stimulus. So let's go through the anatomy of this experiment that we just did. So we had an image on the screen and this image had a center and it had some objects, that pictures that appeared with respect to the center. So this made an impression on your retina. There's your retina there. That information, after a period of about 50 to 70 milliseconds, arrived in the thalamus and also it arrived in a brain stem structure called the superior colliculus. So the retinal information goes directly to the thalamus and also directly to this old area of your brain called the superior colliculus. A second location where it's going to get to is the visual cortex and then eventually to the posterior parietal cortex, the frontal eye field, the basal ganglia, and then look, it's going to come back down to the superior colliculus. So you have this direct pathway from your retina to the superior colliculus, and I'm going to show you this is going to generate that saccade, move your eye, but then there's this indirect pathway that's taking that information to the visual cortex, to the parietal cortex, to the frontal eye field, to the basal ganglia, and then is coming back to the superior colliculus. So what we're going to see is that that image arrives and there's this really super fast structure that could respond to that stimulus and move your eye to some location. But in fact, your brain won't allow that to happen. It's inhibiting this structure from the basal ganglia. It's saying, don't move. Give me time to evaluate what is it that's on the screen. Only after a period of evaluation has taken place, I see there's a face, there's this other thing, there's this chair, there's this noise, there's this upside down face. I'm going to evaluate these things, form something that says, I think I like the face more than anything else. Let's go there. And when it does that, it releases the colliculus. It sends the commands to move your eye there. And then there's also two pathways. There's this direct pathway to these motor neurons that are going to move the eye and there's this indirect pathway, the cerebellum, that we saw a little bit about when we talked on Monday. Eventually, that information gets to the motor neurons, it gets to the muscles, boom, it moves your eye. This takes about 200 milliseconds. That's what happened when the image was displayed, you made a decision, your eyes moved to that location. And so it's a very rapid way by which two things are happening. One, you have information that arrives to a location that could generate a saccade, but it's prevented from doing so. Why? Because the cortex needs time to evaluate what is it that you're seeing, assign a value 
to the various parts of that image. Then once you decide to make the movement, I want to move over here, these commands are sent to the eye muscles, a copy of it goes to the cerebellum, and that's going to make the eye actually move in a way that's correct, precise. So basically, cerebellar patients, people who have deficits here, make saccades, but they miss the target. They go too far or they go not far enough. They call dysmetria. So your ability to make precise movements each and every time comes because this structure, the one that we talked about on Monday, that makes predictions as movements are taking place, is guiding it. Today, most of what we're going to be talking about is how does this value function forming? How do we assign these stimuli that we make decisions toward some value? And we're going to talk about reward and effort. And we're going to talk about how do we incorporate these things. And then we make a movement. Okay. But we're going to begin with what the collicula sees. So suppose you're looking at the center of this screen here, right there. <coughs> And then this is to the right, and this is to the left, this is up, and this is down. And at time zero, here's the information that's on the screen. There is that face upside down, face right side up, and the chair and noise. So, at about 100 milliseconds, after this image appears on your retina, the colliculus receives this information. You have two colliculi. There's a colliculus on the right side of your brain stem. There's a colliculus on the left side of your brain stem. This is a particularly important, historically, the information that I'm telling you now to us at Johns Hopkins, because the person who figured all this out, his name was David Robinson, and he was a professor. He was one of the first professors of biomedical engineering who figured out the colliculus and how it encodes visual stimuli. So, this is the right colliculus, this is the left colliculus. You notice there's this, this graduation of the map, of the visual space. So the right colliculus is going to see the information to the left of the center, and the left colliculus sees the information to the right. And this is 2 degrees, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 40 degrees, in this way, and in this direction is vertical. So let me show you how that map looks like. So here's the center and the center is going to map onto this part of the colliculus. It's called the rostral pole. All right, a vector that moves to the left, say 180 degrees, is going to map on right here. That vector here is going to activate cells here. A vector that goes in this direction is going to activate the colliculus there. And the green vector here is going to activate the right colliculus here. Okay, so we're getting a topography of the visual space onto the colliculus. The left visual space is mapped onto the right superior colliculus. So almost all vertebrates that I know of have this structure. A frog has this structure. So when a stimulus goes on, a bright light, it activates the colliculus of the frog and the frog will pay attention to that region. It will orient itself to it. Now you can control what you will orient yourself because you don't just have the colliculus, you also have your entire cortex. And your entire cortex is responsible for determining, is this, this stimulus something that I should pay attention to or I want to ignore them? It's like there's some important person in this room. I know they're important, but I don't want to look at them. You can do that. You can ignore and not direct your gaze, despite the fact that you know there's something important to one side. Okay, so let's take our upside down face. It will appear here on the colliculus. The right side up face will appear here. And then the left colliculus will map the image on the right side of the visual, visual field. So you get the chair over there, and you get the noise patch over there. Okay. So. The colliculus, in particular, the superficial layers of the colliculus, have neurons that respond to visual information on the retina at about 100 milliseconds. The right colliculus has a map of the left visual field. The left colliculus has a map of the right visual field. Any questions about this so far? So we've gone now about 100 milliseconds into that decision-making process that you did at the beginning of the lecture. You have this map that forms on your colliculus. Okay. 
But why is it that you don't move? Well, because at 100 milliseconds, the cortex hasn't figured out what is it that it's seeing. It needs time to evaluate the visual information. And the basal ganglia is inhibiting the colliculus. It's mapping a whole bunch of neurotransmitters that are preventing the colliculus from firing despite the fact that the visual information came. And I've represented that with this purple field here. So you, you're going to have to activate neurons in the colliculus to move. So for example, you need to activate this neuron over here to move your eye to the right by some amount. And these neurons here to move your eye to the left by some amount. But the basal ganglia won't allow that to happen until the cortex has had a time to evaluate. What is it that it's on the retina? Okay, so there's inhibition there. All right. So, you will get an eye movement when there is a burst of activity on the map of the visual space. So, some neuron here has to be allowed to activate. And if that neuron were to activate, it will move the eye precisely to the location that's specified by this map. So, if a neuron here gets activated, the eye moves to the right to a location specified by this map. So something has got to activate that neuron, allow it to reach threshold, and then say, make a saccade. So here was our visual field. At 200 milliseconds, what happens is that the basal ganglia removes the inhibition. So the right basal ganglia is going to come and remove the inhibition from the right superior colliculus, allowing a leftward saccade to take place. And then there is excitation now coming in from elsewhere from the parietal cortex, from the frontal eye field. These are the places in the brain that evaluated that image and said, what really matters to me is this face. That's where I want to take my eye. And so it activates a neuron over here and says, all right, move the eye there. And then the movement takes place. So sorry, this one, I, I have it over here. This neuron gets activated, the eye moves to that location. That's the saccade is made. At about 200 milliseconds. Okay. So. That the other side of the colliculus would maintain? Inhibition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The other side is not allowed to fire. Okay. So, soon after visual information falls on the retina, the superficial layers of the colliculus respond. They just reflect what's on the fovea. The right colliculus has a map of the left visual field. The left colliculus has a map of the right visual field. For the eyes to move, neurons in the intermediate layers of the colliculus must fire. However, at this point, the basal ganglia is inhibiting the colliculus, and therefore the eyes stay fixed at the center. The neurons in your cortex, along with the basal ganglia, evaluate this visual information and assign a value to each image. The image with the highest value is the upright face. The basal ganglia reflects this value, removing the inhibition for those neurons in the intermediate layer. And then, you know, the parietal cortex and the frontal eye field excite, excite the same neuron and your eye moves there. So your saccade is made to a face. So our first idea for today. The brain assigns value to stimuli. We tend to direct our attention and movement towards stimuli that we personally find most valuable. Okay? All right, so this says there is something good to be had at this particular location, and this measure of goodness is something that is evaluated by the cortex based on your prior experience, based on your state, and then it directs your attention, it orients you toward that location. Okay, so our first idea is you tend to orient toward things that you value. The second idea is when you move toward that thing that you value, the vigor by which you move is affected by the value you assign to that stimulus. So let's see this in an experiment. So again, we have a face, we have an inverted face, we have some objects, and we have some pixels. You put a person in a room. You show them a red dot. They're asked to maintain looking at this red dot, but then a face appears to one side. They have to keep looking at the red dot. They can't go yet. 
the red dot moves to where the face used to be after the movement is over you show them the face so the idea is they make a movement in anticipation of seeing something that they value after they make the movement you show them what is it that they were expecting okay so this is like reward reward is given after the action was performed you make a movement you see the face after you finish the movement does that make sense okay we're going to compare now the movement that you made when you anticipated seeing a face versus you anticipated seeing something else like say noise and here's what happens if you look at the eye movement that takes place this is velocity of the eye this is when the movement begins this is approximately when the movement ends so this is about 60 to 70 milliseconds how long it takes to make a saccade if you then look at the peak velocity what you see is that the person makes a faster saccade if they are anticipating seeing a face as compared to seeing noise. So there is greater investment of energy. You move faster, you get there sooner if the stimulus that you are orienting yourself toward, moving toward, has greater value. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions so far? All right. So here's an ex experiment that you can try with a reasonably um, accurate uh, measure of time for a movement. So what this experiment did is pretty simple. It took some candy bars and asked subjects to reach to a single candy bar from a constant start position. So the person sits at a table and there's a candy bar here and their hand is here and they're asked, okay, reach to it like that to pick it up. So you measure how long it took for them to reach. Then what they did is that they gave various candy bars in some random order. After each reach, the subjects, well, after the reaching movements were completed, they completed a survey describing their preference for the candy. So some people liked, you know, the Hershey milk chocolate, some people liked Reese's. And then what they did is that they looked to see what was the speed of their movement, the reach duration. And what they found is that basically people reached faster toward candies that they liked more. Does that make sense? Yeah. At the beginning of the experiment, did, they, did you tell them to reach for a certain candy bar? Only one candy bar at a time. So there was did you specify which one it was, or could they reach for whatever they wanted? So uh, I, we didn't do this experiment, so this was somebody else's experiment. But the experiment is that at any particular movement, there's only one candy bar. And then they change candy bars every trial. So you reach maybe, say, 100 times with different candy bars. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so let's summarize where we are. We think that the basal ganglia, along with these cortical structures, assign value to stimuli. We tend to produce movements towards stimuli that has the highest subjective value. Our second idea today is that the relative value of the stimulus affects the speed by which you move. We move faster towards stimuli that our brain assigns a greater value. So one, we assign value, we move toward things that we value more. That's a decision-making problem. You know, I have two options, A and B. Which one I should choose? I should pick the one that I value more. I should move toward the stimulus that values more. But two, I will move more vigorously toward the stimulus that I value more. So the rest of the lecture is about forming our first in intuitions about a mathematical model that we can use to think about why this might be, what is happening in these, in these evaluations that we're talking about. Okay, so in order to move forward, we need to have one more concept. We need to have a concept of time. And what does time do to things that we value? Say money. What does time do to money? So a dollar today, as compared to a dollar in a week, which one is better? Today, right? Because why wait a week if you can have it today? So what this means is that reward, things that you value, are better if you get them sooner. Right? 
Who wants to go to a great restaurant if you have to wait three hours to get fed? Well, you're a very patient person. <laughs> <laughs> if that same great restaurant gave you the food after one hour, I'm sure you'd be happier. Okay, so the idea is time is valuable. Reward is valuable. They interact in some way. And psychologists and economists have been measuring the effect of time and stimulus value for a long time. What have they found? Here's what they have found. So this is a typical experiment that they do. They say, all right, what would you like if I have a choice to make? So would you prefer, say, um, $1,000 in five years or $200 today? Which one would you prefer? Thousand dollars in five years, two hundred dollars today. What do you like? Two hundred dollars today. Does anybody want a thousand dollars in five years? Some people. Okay. Of course, I want you to know there is no bank in America that will take two hundred dollars today and give you a thousand dollars in five years. So you should definitely take thousand dollars in five years. It's a much better deal. However, most people indeed will say that I will take about $400 today and that's equivalent to about $1,000 in five years. And that's shown here. Meaning that time devalues this, this thing that we call money. So after 25 years, $1,000 is worth about $100. So the equivalent of $100 today is a thousand dollars in 25 years. Whereas the equivalent of four hundred dollars today is about a thousand dollars in five years. So time devalues money. And economists and psychologists, they do these experiments on you know people and they ask, okay, make a choice between X amount of money now, Y amount of money later. And then they find out the equivalent point, which is the, the time point where you pick e one or the other at about 50%. And then when you look at that function, which is basically how time devalues money, what you see is that um, the function is a hyperbolic function, meaning that reward, alpha, at time capital T, has a subjective value that's equal to that value now divided by 1 plus some function of t, gamma t. So that's this hyperbolic function, which means that $1,000 now has to be divided by time to give me its value at a year, five years, 10 years. Okay? So time devalues reward. At least when it comes to money, that's the case. And this is also true for, you know, juice or food or any other commodity that you can think of that would have value for the purpose of making a decision. So what this tells us is that the reward that we're seeking is better for us to get it earlier than it is to get it later. So you should try to move as fast as you can because the earlier you get there, the better it is. But on Monday, we saw that, well, if you move fast, you're going to have to spend a lot of energy, motor commands to get there. And you might be inaccurate in the movements you make. So there must be some balance between getting as much reward as possible, as early as possible, and spending as little effort as possible to get there. Right? So there, there's got to be some balance between these guys. So that's what we were trying to do. Put together a simple equation that can put these things together. All right. So this was our objective value of reward. This is our subjective value. And this is what the discounting is. So because time discounts the value of the stimulus, the faster we acquire reward, the better. So why don't we always move as fast as possible? Because fast movements require greater energy. And so you have to pay a cost to get there, to get the reward. So let me show you what we know about energy and speed of movements. So for saccades, we don't know anything. We don't know anything about What's the effort associated with making an eye movement? But we know a lot about energy when it comes to other kinds of things, like walking. So we know how your body spends energy as a function of speed by which you walk. 
So we can ask this question, how fast should you walk to a coffee shop? Well, it depends on how good is the coffee shop for you and how much energy it takes for you to walk as a function of speed. So then, if we put these two things together, we'll be able to come up with the optimum speed to walk to maximize some function that is comparing reward and effort. So, let's talk about energetic consumption of a movement that we can measure. In this case, walking. So, this work was done a long time ago, more than 50 years ago, and here's what the data looks like. So, on the x-axis is the speed of walking. So the average speed, so there's some distance that the person has to cover, and then you look at, well, how, what's the average speed by which they walk? And you know, you could have them walk really slowly, or you could have them really fast, and on the y-axis here is this energetic consumption per minute normalized by their weight. So the energy that they are consuming as they're walking as a function of the speed by which they're walking. And it's very clear, right? That energetic consumption is increasing as a function of the squared speed of walking. Okay, so this is the squared average speed. And so this function is written for you here. E dot has a baseline, some number that says that's the metabolic cost of being alive, plus there's this cost associated with walking, which is dependent on the square of the speed. Okay, so the faster you walk, the more energy you're going to spend, and it goes up as a squared value. Energetic consumption per minute, the rate of energy consumption per minute is going up as a function of the squared of the speed of the movement. So we now have a way to think about the energy that you spend in order to move. All right, so what does this do for us? Well, here was our equation that said the average rate of energetic expenditure as a function of speed of the movement. So, we have to cover a certain distance, say 100 meters. So what we can do is to take our energy here, joules per minute per kilogram, and divide it by speed, x dot, and when we do that, we get energy per unit distance, joules per meter per kilogram, which is e dot divided by x dot. So, which is telling us how much energy per distance are we spending in order to make this movement? Energy per meter per kilogram. It comes from dividing E dot by X dot. And you get a function that looks like this. So if you take this function, E dot is equal to some constant plus X dot squared, divide it by X dot, what you're going to get is that you're going to get 29 divided by x dot plus a constant times x dot. So you're going to get a function that has a form like this. It has a minimum. And this says that if you walk at this speed, you're going to spend the least amount of energy per unit of distance of meters. That's the optimum speed to walk if you want to minimize the energy that you spend. The total energy that you spend will be minimized if you walk at the speed. And biomechanists have known this for a long time. They have understood that animals, if they wanted to conserve energy, which seems like an important thing to do, they should move at a speed that comes from a function that looks like this. But of course, you don't always walk the same speed, right? You sometimes walk fast, sometimes you walk slow, sometimes you run. Why? Because there is a reason to move. You don't just move to conserve energy, you move to get to where the reward is. And the value of the reward will influence of how fast you walk. Yes, sir? So is, uh, is the graph on the left, when you say walking, do you mean like the gate itself is walking, so like the faster speed would just be like speed walking as opposed to phase transition into running? So, yeah, it's always walking. And just to be clear how these measurements are made, these are metabolic things that are measured using oxygen and CO2 that's being, you know, inspired and expired. And you measure those things and you estimate from that some correlate of the metabolics and they're carrying this backpack on them and they're walking really slow or really fast but always walking not running okay so 
This is a healthy person walking, and this is the same person walking if they give them some prosthetic. And you notice that because they're walking with a prosthetic, this function shifts to the left. They walk a little bit slower. And then if you give them crutches, they walk even slower with the crutches. And it seems like it all has to do with this metabolics of walking with these, with these items. People tend to walk near the speed that is minimizing the energetic costs. And it's not just people, all kinds of animals, horses, elephants, many animals that people have looked at, scientists have looked at, tend to walk at the minimum speed. Yes, sir? Why is the energy expenditure increases as we go more slowly? Yeah, yeah. It's because, so it's this, it's this equation. Let's look at this equation. So this equation, if we divide this by x dot, we get what's on the y-axis, right? Okay. On the left side, you have this constant divided by x dot, which means that as x dot is increasing, this is decreasing. On the right side, you have something that's multiplying that x dot, which means as x dot is increasing, e dot is increasing. So there's a function that's going down, a function that's going up. The two, when they add, become like this. So then you get a minimum. But the, the a more important reason is that basically it costs you to be alive. And if you're going to walk really slow, then that's going to be an important factor. Whereas it costs you to walk, the cost of walking is always increasing as the speed is increasing. Yes, sir? How much is that, how much is this correlate with a mechanical and Yeah, I think pretty close. Yeah, so, you know, um, if one had a very nice biomechanical model of the problem of walking, including the muscles and the moment arms and so forth, I think it would be pretty close to the kinetic energy required. In addition, then of course you need the, the cost of being alive. So if you like integrate it as like mechanically the, the, the right quick, the right drop is basically force versus velocity, right? Say again, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So equation on the y-axis, and when you do e by x dot, yeah. pretty much force. Force, yeah. So you're saying that for a small, for a, at a lower velocity, you need like more force, external force? No, no, so, so the, the low velocity stuff that you're seeing here is because of the dominance of this left term. Mm -hmm. the, just the cost of being alive. You're not moving, but... So again, this is energy per distance, right? And if you don't move, then they're going to have a huge cost. Right? Does that make sense? All right. Take a look at it. Come talk to me afterwards. I can, I can try to explain it better for you. All right. But what's the problem with just thinking about biomechanics? Because that's not all there is to movement. Right? So there's differences among how people move. Here's an interesting fact for you. Here's walking speed as a function of population of a city. And people walk a lot faster in cities that are, you know, like New York, than they walk in smaller towns. So, you know, it's not just to minimize energy. This is not what your life is about. You move because there's a reason to move. And so we're going to put some of these things together. All right, so the idea is that you move in order to acquire a rewarding state. This is called the gain. However, you must pay for that action by consuming energy. This is the loss. The utility is the sum of the gains and losses discounted by time. And we should move that maximizes this utility, this, this measure that's going to combine energy that we gain because of the reward that we assume at the end of our movement, energy that we consume to get there, because of the effort that we spend, divided by time it takes to get there. So here's our little equation to put these things together. So on the left is what we call a utility. Here's your, the reason why you're moving. Because you want to maximize something called a utility. You have a reward that you expect to get at the end. This is your reward. And then there's some effort that you're going to spend. This is your energetic cost of the movement it takes to move. And it depends on time. So if you move really slow, you're going to have a different energetic cost than if you move really fast. So T is the duration of your movement. Alpha is the reward that you will get. E is the energy you have to spend to get to the reward. You can think of this equation as the same problem as any decision. You want to, you know, perform an action. Decide what, what, where to go to college. 
Well, you have to think about, all right, the reward that I'm going to get when I graduate, the effort that I'm going to have to spend, and the money that I have to spend to get that degree. Divided by time, how soon can I get out? These are the things that go into making a decision. But we're going to talk about it in a framework that we can manipulate the equation and do actual experiments on it. You know, it's hard to do experiments on the stuff I talked about. On the bottom, we have time. How long did it take to make the movement? And then there's some temporal discount factor. Some people think of this as impulsivity. Some people can't wait to get out. That for them, time goes a lot faster than others. Others seem to be patient. Perhaps that's reflected in this gamma factor. The thing that says how fast time discounts reward. So if you're a person that can wait five years for $1,000, whereas you're another kind of a person that has to have $300 now, perhaps that's a reflection on how gamma is discounting reward, if that's an accurate measure of how you make decisions. All right, so here's idea number three. The value of an action is in terms of reward at stake, the effort, and discounted by the time it takes to complete the action and acquire reward. So we have an equation now, and we want to use this equation to understand why is it that reward makes movements faster. Where does this come from? All right. How does energy vary? Okay, so let's, let's get back to our energy equation. So we have a rate. This is the total rate of energy consumption per unit of mass during walking. It's a constant plus another constant times velocity squared. The net energy per unit of mass during walking is just this term here. So A is just the cost of being alive. CV squared is the cost associated with walking itself. The energy that you consume per unit of mass as a function of distance and duration is just the integral of this with respect to time. So V is distance divided by time. That's velocity. So when I integrate this with respect to time, I get the total energy that I'm going to assume I'm going to consume per unit of mass as a function of distance and duration. So you see, the total unit of energy depends on distance, it depends on duration of the movement. Okay, so one could measure this for various kinds of things. This is for reaching movements, for example. And you can see that, well, you know, if I move really slow, the energy that it takes, the total energy it takes for me to make that movement is dropping. If I move with a higher distance, longer distance, it's a little bit higher. And so you can get an estimate of the C that we were talking about for reaching, and then we have the total energy consumption as a function of mass, distance, and duration of the movement. So here's our function that says how much energy during reaching you will spend as a function of the mass that you're carrying, as a function of the distance that you're reaching, as a function of the duration of the reach. So T the duration of the reach, D, distance of the reach, M, what is the mass that you carry? Okay? So we have a measure of effort now. How long, how much energy it takes to reach? So let's add now reward and let's see what should be the speed by which you reach. Let's manipulate reward, give you a better candy than the one before and let's see if we increase reward, do you reach faster and so forth. All right, so we have reward and effort now. Here's our function. This is the goodness of this movement. Why are you moving? Because to acquire reward. How much effort does it take to move? Here's your effort. And here's the time that we're going to have to figure out. So let's look at the left part of this equation. Alpha divided by 1 plus gamma t, just this left part. I plotted it here for you. So the sooner you get to your candy bar, the better. Because this function is largest over there right? However, the right part of this equation, this part, is plotted here. You see, if you move really fast, you're going to have to spend a ton of energy to do it. So this is the left part, this is the right part, you sum them together, you get this J. And you see it's got a peak. So if you want to maximize utility, there's a particular duration of the movement that maximizes that. Okay? So we have a function that has a maximum. So what we want to know is that how does this maximum vary with things like reward, things like distance, things like mass. So this says 
if you have some reward alpha and you have some effort function that looks like this and this is your utility of the action well then there's this duration of the movement that if you move at this duration you're going to maximize this utility okay all right that's the optimum movement duration all right so here was our equation reward effort utility all right so we want to find the time t that maximizes this utility because that's the optimum duration of my movement. If I want to live in such a way that I maximize the utility of my actions, every action that I perform should be done in such a way that I get the most out of that movement. And by most means, get as much utility as you can. So how do I maximize this? Well, I find its derivative with respect to time, the duration of my movement, right? Because I want to know the time duration that maximizes this function. Well, that's going to occur when this derivative, which is the derivative of this function with respect to t, is equal to zero, right? Just to be clear, let's go back to our function here. See, at this location, the derivative of j with respect to t is zero. So, let's find the derivative of j with respect to t, set it equal to zero, solve for t. Here's what you find. So, when you, when you set this equation equal to zero, all you have is the numerator. The numerator has a t and has a t squared. So when you solve this equation, you get a quadratic formula. That's the duration of the movement that maximizes the utility. So let's look inside this equation. Let's see what we see. So what we see is that in the numerator, you have mass, you have distance, which means that as mass and distance increase, the duration of the movement should increase. As mass increases, Utility decreases. The option is less preferred. Duration of the movement increases. So the optimum movement will become longer in duration, slower as mass increases because the numerator is getting bigger. But look at the, what happens to our J function. As mass increases, this is a negative here. The utility is falling. So if I have to move with one kilogram, it's better than if I have to move with two kilograms. So two kilograms is worse because the utility is lower because of m being larger. And the second equation tells me how fast I should move because it tells me that a mass that's larger, you should move slower with it. And of course, this is what we do, right? If you have a heavy backpack on, you don't walk as fast as if you have no backpack on. Yeah? Is there also does this also uh, partially explain why uh, some people who have like uh, suffer from obesity or something find it so difficult in order to motivate themselves to like uh, so, exercise? So, so, so if the body mass is large, then of course the metabolic costs will become large as well. So it just costs individuals more to do things because they weigh more. In terms of motivation, entirely different topic. Yeah. So, you know, so far we're just very objective things like reward and effort. I mean, as, as objective as you can be on what a reward is, because that, that also depends on you, right? It depends on how much valuable to you is an eclair versus a uh, cheesecake. Which one is better? Well, it depends on your taste. Effort also, who knows what the way the brain evaluates effort, what we've done so far is to objectively think about it in terms of energetic cost of the movement. But in reality, the way your brain measures effort, who knows? Quite complicated. Divide that by time. The basic idea so far, though, I want you to know is that by defining a utility that you have reward, effort, and time, you have a measure of the goodness of the action, meaning that as mass increases, then the utility decreases. Movement with two kilograms is less, has less goodness in it for me than movement with one kilogram. That's number one. And two, the movement that I actually make with two kilograms will be slower because time will be longer, the duration of the movement. Alpha, which is our reward, has the opposite effect. So as reward increases, J increases. It says the utility is higher when I'm moving toward the thing that I like, the reward that I'm going to get. But look at time here. In the numerator, you have an alpha that has a square root in it. In the denominator, you have an alpha that does not have a square root in it. But this says is that as alpha increases, duration decreases. 
meaning you will move faster when reward increases. So that's what I have here. As reward increases, utility increases, and duration of the movement decreases. So two basic concepts with this function. One, utility tells us the goodness of the action. As reward increases, the goodness of what I'm doing, what's the purpose of my movement, it goes higher. I should pick a movement that has higher utility toward the stimulus that, you know, that I prefer than the stimulus that I don't prefer. Second, the derivative of that utility with respect to duration tells me how I should move, whether I should move rapidly or I should move slowly. And the variables that affect the utility, choices that you make, are the same variables that affect the derivative, actions that you produce. Any questions? Yeah. So changing the candy bar just changes the alpha. Yes. And for some, that increases. For others, it decreases. Yeah. All right. So as you increase reward, you go from alpha 1 to alpha 2. Here's what you're doing to your utility. Your utility is higher, but notice, the peak shifts earlier. So the movement vigor has increased. You move more rapidly toward the stimulus that you like more. As you increase mass, utility falls and the movement becomes slower. All right, so let me summarize. We started by talking about eye movement. The basal ganglia along with the parietal cortex and the frontal lobe assign value to the stimulus that you are available to you you tend to produce movements toward things that have the highest subjective value. The relative value of the stimulus affects movement speed. We move faster towards stimuli that assigns a greater value because time discounts the value of the stimulus. $1,000 now is definitely more valuable than $1,000 tomorrow. The faster we acquire the rewarding stimulus, the sooner that we require it, the better. However, if we have to do things to acquire that stimulus, if we have to move fast to acquire that stimulus, that's going to require energy. The utility of movement, we can think of it as a sum of gains and losses of that movement, discounted by time. Reward we attain is the gain, energy we spend is the loss. So we had a simple equation, we have utility, we have subjective value of reward, we have energetic cost, we have duration of the movement, and we have the temporal discount factor. So this background gives you a sense of this concept of utility and how much we spend things, you know, how much we, may, we might make decisions and how we might make movements. But it's really just the beginning of this, this way of thinking because, you know, the, there's, it's much more complicated than the story I've been telling you. I just want to give you a sense of that. Let me give you an example. Think about Halloween. You go to a house, they offer you a bowl of candy and you reach for it. Okay? Compare that to a normal day where that same candy might be offered to you and you reach for it. So on Halloween, your time is a lot more valuable than on any other regular day for reaching for candy. You have to get to as many houses as possible before they turn off the light. So when your time is valuable, you're going to behave differently in how you move than when there's nothing going on. So it's not just the immediate reward that's of importance, which is all we've been talking about so far, but also what's the environment? You know, what's your history? What's your future? In that context, then it becomes a much more complicated problem. The way you move is only partially a reflection of the current choices that you have. It's also dependent on the previous choices you've made and the future options you're going to have. But that's a much more complicated problem. All right, let me stop now. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer it for you. All right, see you Friday.